It's hard to believe it's almost a decade ago that we witnessed one of the biggest upsets in an NBA Finals ever. And while no one can forget the upstart Dallas Mavericks taking on the domination that was LeBron, Wade, and Bosh, you might not remember how they got there in the first place. So, let's go through the footage to examine just how much their lone star had to carry them all the way to the title. It all started in the first round when Dirk hit the Blazers with a pair of 33-point games. Here's a set the Mavericks loved to run when Jason Terry was in. They'd run him off an Iverson cut across the court, but they have Dirk follow him to the wing to set an inside ball screen. When nothing materializes, they flow into another pick and roll before Dirk goes to work at the end of the shot clock and shoots right over Wes Matthews for the and one. And when they ran pick and roll for Jason Kidd, they were always looking to force the switch and let Dirk go to work on the smaller player, with Matthews again giving up a three-point play. Of course, their go-to play was the post-up, and he got down to that left block every chance he got when a smaller player was on him. Nicholas Batum gets rudely introduced to the Dirk leg when he fades away off the left foot and raises the right knee to get lift in the air, but to also provide some space between him and his defender. And the double drag screen for Kidd was another go-to play. Depending on who the other screener was with Dirk dictated what happened. When it's Sean Marion, they spread for a low post catch. The simple face-up and high-arcing shot was almost unstoppable for them. And if there ever were a basketball museum for long-forgotten moves, here's Dirk's famous isolation out top with the jab-step, jab-step rise up from 17 feet. Here's that same Iverson cut, this time for J.J. Barea, with Dirk popping out to the three-point line after he screens for the ball. When Rudy Fernandez is forced to pick him up once the ball comes all the way back around, forget about it. He's going to get an easy shot every time. Same play, and this time, instead of Dirk popping out, he rolls to the rim. While it might not be very smooth and actually a bit awkward, two points is two points. When it got down towards the end of the game, the Mavericks prefer to pare down their offense to the essentials, with the Jet and Dirk running the two-man game. Turning over his right shoulder is a devastating move, and LaMarcus Aldridge should know this because he's got the same deadly shot. Watch how Dirk uses the fake to get Aldridge off his feet before fading away, leaving Aldridge helpless. Credit the Mavericks for sticking to what worked, and this Iverson cut allowed Jason Terry to force the switch once they float back into the pick and roll. Let's face it, Wes Matthews simply had no hope of stopping a guy who was around 8 inches taller than him. By the way, in these two games he scored 33 points, not one three-pointer made. Can you believe that? Let's move on to the next round, where the two-time defending champion Lakers were waiting and they had home court advantage. After taking the first two games, Dirk hung a 33-piece on them in the pivotal third game that completely broke the Lakers' spirit. Normally, he's not this aggressive looking for a shot to start the game, but in that first quarter, he got running in transition, and after the two-bounce pass across the court got through, no one picks up Dirk on the right wing forcing Kobe to fly by before stepping in for the 20-footer. I know, just stay behind the line, man. There was less pattern offense for Dirk in this game, as their motion flows into the pick and pop. And let's face it, this was just not the series for Pau Gasol, who was never going to get back out to his man. Expecting Lamar Odom to get there was silly, and Dirk has got it going early. When they involve both Pau and Andrew Bynum in the pick and roll, yikes. They don't even try to move so Dirk can lick his thumb and check the wind before letting this one splash. They tried putting Andrew Bynum on him towards the end of the first half, and while it did seem to make Dirk give the ball up on the drive, he gets it right back in the right post and just rises up easily when Bynum is late getting a hand up. They ran Sean Marion off a pin down, and when Lamar Odom tried to cheat over the top, Marion flares along the baseline, forcing Bynum to pick him up. Pau does get to Dirk nicely on this shot, but what the heck? Why isn't Dirk in the corner shooting this three? It was so weird to realize that Dirk only averaged 3.4 three-point shots a game for his career. Here's another set that worked well for them all playoff long. The double ball screen on top with Dirk as the first screener and Tyson Chandler the second. 
Once Kid strings this out to the top of the key, watch Chandler look like a fullback in setting the pin down for Dirk. Wide open shot and clean make. It was tense. Tie game with 90 seconds left, and they don't mess around, just letting Dirk isolate from the top of the key. It wasn't pretty, but it got the job done as he plants the left foot hard, establishing the pivot foot, then the right foot plants, taps, the left foot doesn't move, before jumping off both feet and getting the lefty hook to go down. If you forgot, this was the series Ron Artest got ejected in Game 2, and by Game 4, the Lakers knew they were done for, with Andrew Bynum delivering another cheap shot to J.J. Barea, a strange and embarrassing end to a mini-dynasty in L.A. And that brings us to the Western Conference Finals and the young upstart Oklahoma City Thunder. A year away from making the finals, and with not one, not two, but three future NBA MVPs on the court, the Mavericks dispatched them rather easily in five games, with Dirk throwing up a 48-point special in Game 1 to set the tone. He got going right away, and all I could think was, poor Serge Ibaka. And another monster game from Dirk where he did not hit one single solitary three-pointer. Just an endless series of post-ups down low. The Thunder got desperate and tried other defenders, but he just hits Fabo Sevalusha with his patented Dirk leg fadeaway, an unstoppable move. Look at Kevin Durant's legs as he tries to body Dirk, but ends up fouling him. They even tried James Harden, but that didn't work either as he got caught fouling him and putting him on the line. Which was another matter altogether. In this game, Dirk went 24 for 24 from the free throw line, setting the record for consecutive free throws made in a playoff game. So, if he wasn't going to get behind the line, he might as well get to the line. For his career, he is one of only three players who took at least 1,000 free throws and shot 85% or higher in the playoffs. In the most pressure-packed moments, where every point is crucial, Dirk was absolute money from the line and continued to provide clutch point after clutch point to enable the Mavericks to win. Oh, and I gotta say this again, poor Surge, this wasn't a fair fight. Up 2-1 and playing in Oklahoma City, Dirk recognized the importance of ending this series early. A win on the road to go up 3-1 just about guaranteed them a trip to the Western Conference Finals. So he hung another 40-point game on him, hitting two threes and going 14 for 15 from the line. Here's the Iverson Cup for Deshaun Stevenson this time. And when the Dirk ball screen doesn't materialize, check the progression. Dirk cuts back off a double pin down. Serge has no idea what to do, and it's a clean swish. Down seven towards the end of the first half, the Mavericks push the ball and it creates a mismatch. But good job by the Thunder team defense to help and then recover back to their men. Serge does close out, but bites on the big shot fake, tries to recover, but Dirk is like the puppet master, patiently waiting for the opening to nail the 15-footer. And to keep the defense guessing a little bit, they get him the ball at his familiar top of the key area, and this time, he attacks aggressively into the lane with a spin move. Why Kendrick Perkins doesn't help challenge this lefty shot, I have no idea, but it cuts the lead in half. Here's the ball screen for Jason Kidd, with Chandler instantly setting a pin down for Dirk. Ibaka takes the wrong path around the screen, and Dirk gets both feet into the lane before shooting the wide-open 14-footer. They tried Nick Collison on him, and while it made Dirk work a bit harder to get his shots off, it didn't prevent him from keeping them close down the stretch. And this time, he goes right at Collison, knowing they absolutely need a bucket, and the multi-spin move gets him free from 12 feet, basically a layup. And Thunder fans will no doubt be salty by this call, and of course it's out of the Mavericks trying to get Dirk the ball. This should have just been an out-of-bounds call, but instead it allowed Dallas to tie it up, where they eventually won in overtime. And that brings us to the finals. The little engine that could, and the reliance on the German, was apparent in the per-game scoring disparity. It was also interesting to see him shift his scoring methods to spotting up more than anything else. He scored twice as many field goals when beginning his attack on the perimeter than when he posted up. Since the Heat defense did such a good job with pressure, head coach Rick Carlisle wanted to release it before the Mavs turned it over. Watch how the pick and roll between Kidd and Chandler collapses the defense in its zeal to take away the roll. That leaves Dirk with his patented catch and shoot from the top of the key. And they ran misdirection to begin possessions in order to mollify the defense into forgetting about Nowitzki. 
The high post split spreads the defense until Dirk can flash to the elbow for the 15-footer. Despite feeling like they got there in time, Dirk continued to catch his man a half step behind the play and releasing his high release, high arcing shot straight down into the basket. But he would put the ball down on the ground and get to the basket on occasion. And this again served to keep the defense on their toes so they just weren't sure what he was going to do once he got the ball. He was almost playing a zone offense here, just hovering around the free throw line until he could find an opening to get a catch and get right to the hoop with one dribble and a finish. The only solution would have been to face guard him and not let him catch the ball, but you know all he'd do is get down low on the block for a post up. Which brings us to the next most common way he was scoring. And if you felt bad for Serge, then you'd feel doubly sorry for Joel Anthony. On a good day, Anthony was 3 inches shorter than Dirk, but it felt like a lot more as he kept shooting over him. But he did his damage on others as well, like catching LeBron with his gorgeous up and under layup off the delayed break down low. Udonis Haslam could not keep Dirk from turning into the lane and getting layups. He was just too short and not quick enough at this point to have much success defensively. And when Bosch came over to help, it was no use, as Dirk patiently waits for him to fall out of the way before getting the nice bounce. The bottom line was that when they needed him, Dirk was there to get the key basket or free throw, and to bend a completely over-aggressive defense to his will, finding open shots for teammates either by his passing or by his gravity. It's still crazy to me how few three-pointers he took during this run and how different it would be in today's game. But even still, we got a Cinderella story, rooted in the preseason interview I did with Coach Carlisle in the summer of 2010, well not really, that propelled the Mavericks to win after win, series after series, until eventually, both the Mavericks and Dirk Nowitzki were holding trophies. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to B-Ball Breakdown so you can get alerted right away when we drop a new video. This season will be filled with incredible content, so don't miss it. You in?